Hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jago Martinez Acaña. Uh, I've been a student at Newcastle University doing my PhD on electrical machines. And today I'll be talking about the manufacturing and testing of an in-wheel hopper carry motor for automotive traction. This project was developed uh, at Newcastle University in the UK and was funded by Protein Electric Limited. Uh, this presentation will cover the challenges of manufacturing uh, an in-wheel permanent magnet hallback array machine developed for automotive traction. The options for, this assemb for assembling the array in an outer rotor design are discussed from a simulation and a practical perspective. The final machine is experimentally compared to results from a surface, a surface mount permanent magnet machine variant with the same magnet mass. Let's start defining what is an in-wheel motor. So an in-wheel motor, as its name says, is a motor built within the wheel. Uh, we have an image here that really represents all the components on the, mode, on the, on the wheel. This brings several advantages uh, as uh, the integration of the motor and the inverter allows to free up space in the vehicle for other uses. It brings reduction of mechanical components as drive shafts, differentials and gears are no longer needed. And it allows the use of true torque vectoring at each wheel as each wheel can be independently controlled. This, however, has some this topology however, has some drawbacks. Um, the, the, heavier, the heavier wheel brings uh, an increase on the antifung mass, although this can be reduced by modifying the suspension system of the vehicle. It's uh, difficult to manufacture a machine due to all the components and the, and the tight tolerances. And the motor and the electronics are working on a dirty environment hence uh, a good seal needs to be placed. There's here an image of all the components of the in-wheel motor, uh, and this, uh, this work was focused on the, on the rotor of the, of the in-wheel motor. As previously I mentioned, uh, I'll be implementing a Hobak array outer rotor topology. Um, a Hobak array is a special arrangement of the permanent magnets in the rotor of an electric motor that allows uh, an increase of the magnetic field in one side of the array, in this case the, the air gap side, uh, while it minimizes the field on the other side of the array, the, the rotor callback or the rotor back even. This is done by introducing uh, some transition magnets in purple in both images, which have a direction of magnetization perpendicular to the direction of magnetization of the pole magnets. This allows the flux to recirculate through these transition magnets instead of all the flux recirculating through the rotor bar cavern. Uh, the effect of increasing the air gap magnetic field while reducing the magnetic field through the rotor bar cavern can be used in three different ways. For the same rate of torque, it allows an increase on the air gap length, or it allows to increase the rate of torque for the same air gap length and air gap and machine length. This as well, the, the use of a whole back array can as well allow a, a rotor back iron reduction as there's no, no such need of, as that area is not as uh, saturated as it can be. Uh, previous work uh, has shown an increase of rated torque of 5% at continuous and 3% at the overload operation. And this uh, increase in torque was obtained only through, uh, through simulation. The results, this result is, uh, this 
increase in 3% increase at overload uh, has led the design to force uh, the manufacture of a whole Baccarat prototype and this is what uh, this presentation will cover. So in the manufacture of a whole Baccarat rotor, uh, there's some considerations that we, we need to, to think. Um, the forces between the adjacent magnets can be either be can be either attractive or repulsive, and they can change during the assembly the assembly process. So, a study of forces is required, and a special tool needs to be designed to to hold the magnets. Uh, we'll be using uh, a circular shape back iron. So there is no magnet locational feature on the rotor. So we have developed a special location tool to allow us to locate the pole and the transition magnet. Uh, this, this use of a circular shape of chiron as well allows to to use to use it as um, to have a pocket. So between the the straight face or the the face of the magnet and the and the circular back iron, there will be a an air pocket that can be filled with uh, with adhesive, and allows to have a, an adhesive sort of pull. The pole magnets are rectangular, while the transitions are trapezoidal, and this is to maintain a, a consistent air gap and to allow an easier manufacture. This brings two approaches into the manufacture. So we can either place the transition magnet first and then from the center approach the pole magnets, or we can first uh, place the pole magnets and then from the axial direction approach the transition magnets. Well, going through a transition first approach, uh, we can use a locating tool with the shape of the pole magnets to locate the position of the transition magnet and approach them from the center. And once all the transition magnets are in place, we can then approach the pole magnets in position. The second approach uh, the pole first approach uh, it follows a similar procedure. So the locating tool, in this case with the shape of the transition magnet, is placed on the is placed on the rotor on top of the rotor core back as before, and then we can introduce the the pole magnets from the inside of the rotor, and then we can slide from the axial direction the transition magnets as they follow this, the trapezoidal shape, they will be easy, easily uh, fall in place. One of the, of the requirements is that we need to have a special tooling. So to, for both manufacturers' methods, when we need to approach the magnets from the center of the assembly, we need to hold the magnet somehow. So a pole magnet holding tool and a transition magnet holding tool were manufactured. They consist of, a, of an aluminum handle, which is interchangeable, and then um, a tool or a, a holding device made of magnetic um, steel that allows to, to hold the magnet in place. Uh, this uh, comprises as well of a, of a screw that will tightly secure the magnet in position and doesn't allow it to snap or when we don't want it. As well, uh, two transition locating, two tra uh, magnet locating tools were manufactured. Uh, in this case, uh, a transition locating tool that has, uh, they, they both look like a claw like a like a, like the claw of an of an animal, and uh, the transition locating tool has the, the the teeth of the claws have the shape of the poles magnets, while the pole locating tool has the shape of the transition magnets. These uh, tools are made out of aluminium, so it's non-magnetic, 
so if they don't interfere with the forces and with they won't cause any problem as the magnet will not be attracted to them. Um, and they were manufactured using uh, a, a wire cutting machine uh, and a milling machine. As I said before, the forces of the magnet can uh, change uh, direction quickly, uh, and this is something we need to be aware of. So uh, through FEA, a simulation of the, in this case, the, the transition first uh, approach was done. What we can see in this uh, simulation on the right hand side on these graphs is that when placing the the, the first pole, the, attract, the force starts to be attractive and increasing as the pole approaches the, the pocket. However, as it gets closer, this uh, force starts changing direction uh, and it changes uh, through this serial crossing in, in the force, uh, becomes repulsive. So the magnet is in position, when the magnet is in position, it's in position with a repulsive force. The magnet does not want to be in that place. So we need to hold the magnet in place while the, the glue or the adhesive cures. This same issue happens with the, with the, when we approach the second magnet. So that means that every pole magnet will have a repulsive force and we need to hold, to hold the magnet in place while the adhesive cures. When we introduce first the pole magnets and then the transition magnets, uh, what we see when we introduce the transition magnet is uh, an, an attractive force that reaches a 2.7 newton meter peak, which is really a, a very low force. And when the magnet is in place as a distance of zero, it's uh, the forces are almost zero so that means that the magnet wants to be in that position or at least it's like floating there so the repulsion and the attraction forces cancel each other as the magnet has uh, as the transition magnet has a trapezoidal shape it won't uh, position uh, as it cannot as the, the the size of the magnet does not allow to go out What uh, what I did was um, uh, manufacture some Kovac segments instead of the whole machine to try both procedures uh, in a physical from a physical point of view. So on the left hand side we have the tra the transition first approach, and we can see that some of the poles in this one of the pole uh, broke, like one of the magnet segments snap. While well, we have three other floating pole magnets, uh, these floating magnets are because the uh, or the, the magnets they were not placed, they were not held in place properly while the the glue was curing, or so I, I didn't apply or I didn't leave them in place for a long enough time. So if we go through this approach, we will need to find a way to to secure the magnets and keep them and hold them in place while the, the adhesive cures. And this can take up to 24 hours. On the right hand side, we have a, a segment completed using the transition first approach, sorry, the pole first approach. And in this case, nothing snapped, nothing came out of place and everything turned out to be good. So this practical test has shown that the the way to go was the the pole mag the pole first approach. So in uh, a hole locating tool was a hole shape locating tool was manufactured. So it has the whole circumference of the of the rotor. And this is on the right hand side we can see the the whole rotor assembly finished. With this rotor, then uh, some, we perform some dynamic tests to compare the Hovac array machine and the surface mode machine. 
So in this dynamic test, both machines were cooled uh, with 50% glycol uh, at a rate of 13 liters per minute, and this leaves a rotor temperature of 50 degrees C. The, ma the machines were set up in a 200 kilowatt dynamometer for these dynamic tests. Um, we performed three tests on these machines, which were the DC link voltage test, the transient current test, and the and a torque speed envelope test. So on the DC link voltage test, uh, the Hobak array machine can deliver between a 5.5 and a 5.7 higher DC link voltage than the surface mount machine. This shows the higher increase on air gap uh, flux density. And uh, on the transit current test, uh, the Hobak array requires between a 6% and a 15% lower current than the surface mount machine to achieve the same torque. Uh, and this is improved at a higher currents. On the torque speed envelope, the Hobak motor can achieve between 8 and 9% higher torque on the continuous torque region while the, than the surface mount machine, and this can increase up to 22% higher torque uh, during the flux weakening region. The surface mount machine can achieve, uh, power, can achieve a maximum power continuous operation of 52.1 kilowatts, while the whole array machine achieves a power of 62.6 kilowatts, which is a 20.6% higher power what uh, the whole array motor can deliver. So this is all for, for me today. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them. And thank you very much for your attention.